going to push the record button so you all get that message. Okay, let me just make sure that is recording. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Camden Conference community event presentation, The Rise and Fall of the Berlin Wall with Dick and Marianne Topping. I'm Brenda Harrington from the Belfast Free Library. I want to thank you all for joining us. It has been important to us at the Belfast Free Library to continue to host the community event series and glad we've been able to do so virtually. Tonight's program is the third and final one in the Belfast Free Library's hosting in anticipation of this year's Camden Conference, Europe Challenged at Home and Abroad. Before I turn the mic over to Judy Stein from the Com Community Events Committee to offer updates about this year's conference and introduce tonight's speakers, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted and put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A session after the presentation. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Judy. Good evening, everybody. Uh, and. I'm going to start with the sad news and then move on to the good news. Uh, as I suspect everyone on here now knows, uh, sadly, Camden Conference will again be totally virtual this year. Uh, if you purchased a ticket to attend the conference live and you have not heard from the Camden Conference office, please call there, but everyone should have heard by now. Registration, online registration is open on the website. Virtual tickets are $150 per household. Tickets for members at the Envoy level and above are free. Um, so connect and, and register. Uh, watch the Camden Conference website for information and for details. Uh, I can tell you that there will the keynote address will be Friday evening. There will be sessions Saturday, and there will be sessions Sunday morning. So we are going to have a glorious Camden conference on Europe challenged, uh, but it isn't going to be quite the way we had in mind. That said, let me get down to why we're really here and to the good news. Those of you who've been around for a while know Dick from his amazing classes on foreign policy at the Belfast Free Library. I have looked and there are a number of us here tonight who knew Dick when he was program chair of Camden Conference almost 20 years ago. And uh, I counted, but we can't quite celebrate that one yet. Um, <laughs> after having been stationed in West Berlin when the wall went up and uh, <clears throat> through most of the Berlin crisis. And then he's, he spent uh, 30 years at the CIA, ultimately a senior analyst for Soviet domestic politics and Soviet Russian foreign affairs. And that's what he's been helping us and informing us about here ever since. What makes tonight particularly special is that this is the first time that Marianne has joined him in publicly telling the story of those years. And for those of us who've been around and know him, that's pretty exciting. That's because you talked me into it, Judith. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's because you talked me into it. <laughs> okay, okay, well, okay. Well. <laughs> uh, but they had access to very different parts of East and West Berlin. And so what we're gonna hear are the multiple sides and parts of that story. If we were in person, I would ask you to join me in wel welcoming them both here. But if you're not mute, we'd make a hell of a lot of noise. So I'm not going to do that. But I am going to ask you uh, to uh, silently take pleasure in our extraordinary good fortune this evening. Take it away, Dick and Marianne. Oh. Okay. Uh, oh boy. I knew this was going to happen. My first glitch. Uh, hang, on, hang on a second. Let's what see. happened? Uh, What's the matter? I'm not sure. No, 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 no. I don't want to leave a meeting. 
meeting. All I want to do is, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's come back to this. Okay. Uh, uh, screen share. Ah. Okay. Share. Okay. Uh, here you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Here we go, folks. Uh, bear with me. Uh, this is why uh, I was known as Bigfoot at the agency because whenever something went wrong, I'd kick it. Uh, anyhow, let me start off um, with uh, a few thoughts about my first impressions upon arriving in Berlin on the 1st of February back in 1961. I arrived at Potsdam outside Berlin at dawn. And for me, it was a uh, pretty grim introduction to all the wartime destruction there. The, uh, uh, the first shot here that you see, that's uh, Marianne and me uh, out in front of the apartment that we shared with another couple uh, during the first months after she arrived in Berlin. Uh, this was actually taken on the uh, 13th of August after we came back from quote, sightseeing uh, over on uh, Eberstrasse and other parts of West Berlin watching uh, the uh, first strands of barbed wire being erected. Anyhow, uh, when I arrived uh, at Potsdam, the train, the duty train, then moved on to West Berlin. And uh, there, uh, those of us who were representatives for the ASA unit that I was assigned to, we were taken to Andrew's barracks shown here. And up at the top, you can see that's the building where uh, our, our unit was housed. Uh, that's, that's a swimming pool and so on. Uh, Andrew's barracks, earlier the headquarters of Hitler's SS bodyguards. And that's why the swimming pool was there because they loved to the swim. Uh, I was assigned to uh, a listening post out at Tempelhof Air Base shown here, uh, the airport, but the also it was the Air Force Air Base there. And uh, our units, uh, the ASA unit that I was assigned to was up here on the fifth, sixth floor, and we had uh, the uh, some uh, equipment up here in this little addition. Uh, our Air Force colleagues, uh, air support group, they were down on the third and fourth floors. I don't know who was on the first and second, but uh, uh, anyhow, the uh, top four floors were all occupied by uh, various uh, forms of intelligence collection people. Um, the uh, job there uh, was uh, an exhausting one because uh, your shift rotated from days 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. to eves 4 p.m. to midnight and then mids midnight to 8 a.m. with uh, two days off between each rotation. And believe me, I never got accustomed to it, neither did a lot of my friends. Uh, uh, the the mid-shift was really, really bad. And to be honest, uh, the job itself proved to be a boring letdown after my year-long Russian language course at the Army Language School, ALS. One colleague once claimed that uh, if they could train monkeys to understand Russian, uh, they wouldn't have needed any of us there. They could have just had the monkeys uh, uh, monitoring the equipment. But um, uh, part of the reason why it was so boring though, uh, it was largely because the Soviet side had learned a lot about our operations and our personnel from one of our Russian linguists, a guy who had fallen into their hands in October, 1960, just a couple of months before I got there. Security tightened on both sides soon thereafter. We heard less chatter on the Soviet commo links and Major McDonald assumed command of our ASA outfit with orders to quote, clean house, unquote, and set things right. Now he was a former MP and he seemed a lot more concerned about haircuts and keeping our work sites ready for inspection by any visiting delegations, rather than ensuring that we collected as much information as possible. And he made damn sure that none of us would make any more trips into the Russian sector of Berlin. 
Uh, discipline had been slack before October 1960. Well, that all changed after McDonald arrived uh, at the end of the year. Now, uh, the next thing, uh, my uh, five months of uh, uh, waiting around there for Mary Ann to join me at the end of June. Uh, let me just say that uh, this 23 year old GI found several ways to kill time while I was anxiously waiting for Mary Ann to arrive. I enjoyed exploring the uh, neighborhoods around Andrews Barracks with its cobblestone streets and old buildings. I enjoyed playing bridge in the weekly USO sponsored duplicate tournaments at Andrews. And I began reading the rise and the fall of the Third Reich. Uh, one site that I really had trouble with, uh, the, uh, the invalids you would see in the neighborhood, uh, presumably World War II veterans, uh, sitting in their wheelchairs outside uh, the uh, various Krankenhausen, uh, small hospitals, uh, health clinics, uh, and, the, and that sort of thing. Uh, many of them were missing uh, at least one limb, uh, and those that uh, were missing an arm had their uh, armchairs equipped with a special lever that was attached to the axle, so that with the remaining arm, they could crank that lever and thus propel themselves along the sidewalk uh, or uh, even across those cobblestone streets. And uh, that was my first time viewing somebody who had uh, paid a price as a consequence of World War II. Uh, my only personal experience with it uh, uh, was the, the time an air raid warden Warden came by the uh, cottage we were riding along the Connecticut shore and uh, uh, told us to make sure the um, blackout curtains were uh, secured because there was a little bit of a light showing from one of the windows. Um, okay, I also had a lot of fun, however, taking sailing lessons in the small boats docked at the American facility on the Vonze, a large lake on the southwest edge of the city. Now, there were, however, two dangers when you went out sailing on the Vonze. The first was that it was part of a river system that uh, merchant ships used to transport goods into West Berlin. And uh, those ships had the right of way and they did not uh, alter course if uh, one of our small sailboats happened to uh, wander in front of them. Not a very good outcome awaiting the people in one of those small sailboats. The other danger was that if you sailed too far out across the lake, and uh, near the, uh, uh, the other shore, uh, you were nearing East German territory, uh, outskirts of Potsdam. And uh, the uh, East German border guards would uh, take one of two courses of action. Either they'd open fire on you, or they'd send out a small boat with armed uh, border police uh, to uh, take you into custody and thus uh, put you in a situation where you were likely to be interrogated uh, uh, by uh, either the Stasi, uh, the East German security police, or by uh, the uh, Soviet KGB officers stationed there. In either case, it was not going to be a picnic if you got picked up. Uh, at the Vonze, uh, US occupation forces had confiscated a large waterfront house that once belonged to a member of the SS. And you'll find me coming across the pa crossing paths with the SS on several occasions. We understood that the house had originally been owned by a wealthy Jewish family, one that disappeared during the Holocaust. On June the 28th, my 20 year old bride finally arrived. Little footnote for you. For the next three months, I would remain Marianne's legal guardian. Yeah, right. 
to be honest, I could hardly <laughs> wait to get my arms around her. And so after she cleared custom, off we went in the almost new, took 6,000 miles, bright blue VW I had recently purchased from a fellow ASA grunt. And now Mary Ann's turn. My first days in Berlin started in June, June 28th through July 1st in 1961. My reason for wanting to be in Berlin was 100% wanting to be with Dick. At the time our plans were settled, I could finish my senior year of college with the local University of Maryland in Berlin. Unfortunately, the school decided to close its doors for the year to renovate the building. So my hopes were that I could finish after returning to the States. After packing my clothes in one suitcase, no slacks because German girls did not wear slacks and just one pair of Bermuda shorts for Sundays at the Vanze. I flew to Berlin with Chris Schwartz, another army wife whom I had only met a day earlier. The landing at Tempelhof Airport was now scary, but interesting because they came down over a cemetery between two rows of apartment houses, so close that the plane's wingtips almost scraped the buildings. A self-important one German customs agent entertained himself by searching my baggage, not a good welcome to Germany. A few words about Hal Schwartz. Chris's husband, Hal, was one of my classmates at the language school in Monterey, California. The signs of the Provo Marshal Office at Andrews, Hal worked on liaison relations with the other three occupying powers, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Thanks to his ability to speak French, German, and Russian all very well. But his main focus was on the Soviet Union and related intelligence missions, missions that would frequently take him into East Berlin. And now I spent some time getting settled. All four of us, the Schwartzes and Dick and I, preferred a modern bathroom and hot water. And we decided to share the apartment that Dick and Hal deemed appropriate. After an extensive search, they found a modern two bedroom place in Steglitz, a locale in southwestern Berlin. The rent made it difficult for us to save for the future. The Wilkinson's wedding on July 1st was our first big social event. Jim, one of the men in Dick's ASA unit, married Anne, his American fiance. I don't remember very much about the wedding itself. But I do recall that in keeping with German custom, a horse-drawn coach carried the couple to the reception at a nearby inn. It was a lovely reception, but after the fellows at our table began to order bottles of champagne and Steinhager, how the alcohol did flow. And I wasn't a big drinker. <laughs> Everyone gathered at our apartment later that evening, our first party. Chris and I were fine, but all the men were three sheets to the wind. That is everyone except Mitch, Don Mitchell, an older chap. He was a career mil military fellow. He took on the role of caretaker and saw to it that everyone got back to the barracks safely. And now new friends and an adventure. I quickly learned that Dick and Hal's comrades needed women friends, not girlfriends, but perhaps semi-sisters. I became that person to several of the fellows to became friends for life. Bill Stearns wound up marrying one of my close friends, Mary Schubert. The other Roger Weaver also lived in Washington DC area as we did for 30 years. On Sundays, Dick and I attended services at the Anna Kirk, a small 12th century Lutheran church. It had beautiful frescoes. And then we drove out to the Von Zay for a day of sailing. We almost always went to the lake to join Barb and Fred Meyer, who were about 20 years older and had become our Berlin family. Fred was a career military man working as liaison officer with the West, Ber Ber West Berlin police. Barb was an accomplished cook, having attended a Cordon Bleu school, and she taught me quite a bit in that area. We frequently spent our time at their apartment playing bridge, enjoying dinner, and especially becoming part of their family. During the week, we enjoyed playing in the duplicate tournaments at Andrews on Wednesdays, except when Dick was on Eve's at TAB. 
Yes, there are, there are quite a few of the bottles, but there were more sometimes too. Yeah, that's at the EM Club after bridge. After bridge, that is correct. Yeah. I also crammed one other adventure into my first month and a half in Berlin, crossing into East Berlin. As Dick mentioned earlier, he was not allowed to go there. I went there with Hal and Chris in their Carmen Gia. While West Berlin was a technicolor city, vibrating with life and excitement, very cosmopolitan, daring, raucous, lewd, and sometimes even dangerous. In the East, everything seemed gray. The cars, the buildings, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not joking, that is how it looked. There was a Russian bookstore in the East. I purchased how, how it was there in East Berlin, I often wondered. I purchased a large book with copies of 19th century Russian paintings, a famous Chinese print of four horses that now hangs on the wall in our family room, and a charming picture of a young girl kneeling while blowing at a seed-filled dandelion, which I gave to our daughter Drew years later. And she happens to be watching this too. By mid-July, Barb Meyer, who was volunteering at the Marienfeld Center, had recruited me to help prepare refugees from the East for their departure from Berlin to resettle in West Germany or elsewhere. Many of them had escaped from the East within the past day or two and were still in shock. They just knew that a big change was coming but had no idea where they would be sent. I remember making a huge number of butter logs, one by two inches, to go with their brochen breakfast rolls for a, a good meal before they were sent to the West. Now let me uh, pick up with uh, the joyful events of uh, August 13th, 1961. A little background. Uh, tension had been building in Berlin all summer, ever since JFK's failed summit with Nikita Khrushchev at Vienna in early June. We knew that Khrushchev had threatened to sign a separate peace treaty with East Germany, thereby terminating the three Western powers occupation rights in West Berlin. And the East German leaders, worried about losing their best and brightest to the West, were insisting that Moscow do something to curb the refugee flow. So many of us wondered how long before the balloon goes up. Before starting his church service on August 13th, Pastor Otto informed the congregation that the East Germans had begun to barricade all the entry points into the East in the middle of the night. I looked around and suddenly realized that I was the only adult male at the Amakirka service that morning. All the other men had been summoned to one post or another to deal with the emergency. After Marianne and I returned to our apartment, we agreed with Hal and Chris that the four of us should get a look at where the uh, barricades were being erected. Now, this is a scene along Eberstrasse near the Brandenburg Gate. And right there is Chris Schwartz, Hal's wife, our good friend. Anyhow, uh, we spent several hours witnessing protests at various points in central Berlin, especially the Brandenburg Gate and the nearby Soviet War Memorial on the 17th of Unistrasse. Now here you see a crowd of East German, East Berliners standing at the barbed wire and you've got the armed uh, board, border guards and Vopo, uh, the uh, East Berlin police, uh, keeping them under control. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. With Hal and Chris, we joined the Germans who were whistling and yelling, phooey, phooey, to express their anger and contempt for the Vopos. They were the East German police and armed factory guards who were preventing would be escapees from getting through the barbed wire near the huge famous Brandenburg Gate, which helped to divide the city. But I'll tell you one thing. If you see, this is a Wasserkannen. Uh, a water cannon. And at that point, the uh, factory guards had just come on out armed with Tommy guns. And when this thing came on out, we didn't know what it was at, the, at, at first glance. 
So most of those of us who are standing over here on this side of Eberstrasse ducked into the uh, bushes along the edge of the Tiergarten, the huge park in the center of the city. Uh, it's enormous. And uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen. We tried to take cover. And then eventually we called back on out again and uh, began, once again began to whistle and yell fooey, as Marianne described. Right. No, it's you. Um, oh, my turn. Uh, to be uh, accurate, more than 3 million people had escaped East Germany by August the 13th. Others would attempt to do so in the future, but it would become far more difficult and dangerous. Three would-be escapees would soon die at the wall on August 22nd, the 24th, and the 29th. On that third occasion, all four of us, Mary Ann, Hal, Chris, and I, watched as West Berlin police officers dragged the Teltow Canal searching for the body of Roland Hoff, who was just 27 years of age. Another 23 victims would lose their lives at the wall by the time the toppings left Berlin in August 1902. And another 114 would die there before it finally collapsed in November 1989. The day after we visited the wall, if you can call it a visit, to uh, watch the uh, pro, uh, you know, participate in the protests on the 13th. Uh, that next morning on the 14th, Hal and Chris left Berlin to enjoy two weeks on leave in West Germany. Meanwhile, a large crowd of East German refugees were still waiting to register at the Marienfelde Center. This, this picture was taken there on the 14th. A day later, border guard Conrad Schumann jumped over the barbed wire, escaping into West Berlin. News photos of his exploit went viral, if such an expression can be said to uh, apply to something that occurred in that pre-internet era. Finally, a couple of days later, much to our delight on August 20th, Colonel Glover Johns led a convoy of 1,500 GIs into West Berlin. It was a largely, it was largely a symbolic gesture, but it was a great relief to us. Uh, a symbolic gesture because at that same time, barbed wire was being turned into uh, what the, uh, uh, a concrete wall what the East Germans called their concrete rose. As I say, even if it was a symbolic, it was greeted by a throng of cheering West Berliners, uh, as well as Vice President Lyndon Johnson, other senior American and German officials, and a large part of the US garrison. And now for me, getting accustomed to a new reality from September to October, 1961. In September, when Chris became the school nurse at the American School for Dependent Children, I began working at the small Harry Hicks at Tempelhof, a mammoth building, one of four that Hitler had planned to build and thus encircled the airport. And you saw part of it earlier with, with Dick's pictures. As mentioned earlier, Dick also worked at Tempelhof at the other end of the huge building, about one half mile from the PX. My boss there was Miss Algram, a German woman who always was on edge. I never knew why until Hal told me after I was home in the States that she had eventually been arrested and sent to prison as an East German spy and agent. But Miss Algram never learned anything from me. I have a very tight mouth. Only after Halry returned to the States in 1964 did I learn that her parents lived in East Berlin, giving Miss Algram no chance to refuse working for the Stasi, the East German Security Service. And that was always very sad to me, it still is. I enjoyed my job at the PX as I really liked dealing with people. 
The, the other employees were Annalise Wegner, who had three daughters, Frau Banks with twin daughters after being raped by a Russian soldier in 1945, and Herr Piepenhagen, the one man working there, were all very friendly. Another footnote, the only way the PX agreed to hire an American was to have me work only part time. That way the PX did not have to pay me the US minimum wage. So I worked approximately 39 hours each week. And now for the other great crisis in Berlin that year, the uh, tank standoff at Checkpoint Charlie. On the 22nd of October, East German Greppos, their border police, demanded that the US uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Alan Leitner, uh, the uh, father of uh, our own Ned Leitner, who runs uh, Belfast TV, uh, Alan Leitner and his wife demanded, the border guards demanded that they provide proof of their identity before they entered East Berlin. And that was a violation of the Four Power Agreement negotiated in 1945 at Potsdam. By the 25th, 10 US tanks stood uh, just yards apart, facing 30 Soviet tanks. Now this picture is uh, early on the 25th before the Soviet tanks had uh, rolled up uh, as far as they would eventually come. These are your US tanks uh, that uh, were sent to uh, Checkpoint Charlie by uh, uh, General Luke Clay, the, uh, the hero of the 1948-49 uh, Berlin uh, blockade, who had been sent back to Berlin as JFK's uh, personal emissary in uh, uh, August, uh, early September of uh, 1961. Uh, at one point, uh, okay, but by the time, uh, the, late in the day on the 25th, you had 10 facing uh, 30, and that remained the case through the next day, uh, uh, the next two days. Uh, this confrontation eventually ended in a stalemate on uh, October 27th, 28th, as is shown here in this picture, after quite a few nervous hours. At one point, uh, probably the uh, evening of the 27th, Hal ran into our apartment to give Chris all the money that he had. He also told the two girls, if I can use the term girls. Uh, Perfectly, all right. Okay. This is to, an 81 year old girl. Yeah, to pack a single bag a piece and get ready to be evacuated from Berlin on an emergency flight. One that really would have had absolutely no chance of getting off the ground. My shift out at TAB Again, as I said, we're occupying the fifth and sixth floors. We've got some special equipment up here, and you can see all the antennas around there. Uh, and I'll uh, talk about their utility in a minute. But anyhow, uh, we were issued live grenades, and we were told to get ready to destroy the site on the sixth floor if the uh, proverbial balloon went up. Then we were supposed to climb down a spiral staircase while the Air Force guys two floors below were taking similar steps to destroy their equipment. Say what? Yeah. And our colleagues at Andrews Barracks gathered in the mess hall there were issued M1s in live ammo. They loaded their weapons and prayed that no one would let off a loose round or two. Uh, Although we belonged to a special operations unit, as we were renamed in June of 61, we carried dictionaries or tools for repairing radio equipment, not guns or any other weapons of one sort or another. Uh, and we non-combatants usually had a weapon in our hands only once a year for the annual visits to the firing range in the Grunwald, the Green Forest, to remember how to load an M1 and keep it pointed down range. Now, 60 years later, I don't know whether our unit ever picked up any useful chatter on the Soviet commo links 
during that standoff at Checkpoint Charlie. But I do know that our ability to get an accurate fix on where those common sites were located by rotating the antennas until you got as clear a signal as possible for whenever number 139 was checking in with number 128 or other such numbers. And whether they were stationary or moving around was absolutely essential in determining just how close we were to having that proverbial balloon go up. Yes, Virginia, our ASA unit really did play a crucial role during this, as did our Air Force colleagues and our British cousins up at Tegel. And now on to my second trip into the East. Now remember, this was after the wall came up. My second visit to the East Berlin was in late October or early November, when Irving Firestone, Hal's boss, but not his true name, invited Chris and me to accompany him while he checked out Mr. Trent, a new American employee at the Provost Marshal's office. A wise decision. For reasons that I won't go into, Mr. Trent failed his tryout and was sent out of Berlin without, within for 24 hours. His first suggestion was for Chris and me to shake a leg, this is Mr. Trent, you understand, and get the Vopos, East German police, to let us enter East Berlin. We were let in with Mr. Firestone's, Firestone's papers or just the special license on his car. Once again, we entered a weird gray and blackish world with a lot of debris from World War II. But this time, every window of buildings near the wall were bricked up or cemented to prevent escapes. Meanwhile, tunnels were being built by those trying to get out and by the West Berliners and others who wanted to help. Probably the most important part of that adventure was my seeing the location of Hitler's bunker underground haven. And then closing out 1961, later in the fall, the Toppings and Schwartzes decided to move to separate places. Hal and Chris would soon qualify for government quarters, but we could not as we would be leaving Berlin in August of 1962. Before parting, the four of us enjoyed a Thanksgiving dinner together. I had never cooked that holiday dinner, so Chris taught me how to do the turkey. We have remained close friends even now with Chris after Hal passed away three years ago. Dick and I rented two rooms from Frau Wegner who worked at PX with me sharing the kitchen and bathroom. Yes, it all did work. Although I wonder a bit these many years later, just how we did that. Frau Wegner had three daughters. One was my age, the middle one. Christmas that year, our first away from our families in the United States was a wonderful experience. Frau Wegner had Dick light the real candles on her real tree. There were no mishaps and it was beautiful. We spent Christmas with two of Dick's ASA colleagues. Bill Stearns and Roger Weaver, who ate all the roast beef that we were hoping to make last for a week, but they sure enjoyed that beef, so it was worth having them enjoy it so much. The next day was our first anniversary as a married couple, celebrated with a delightful dinner in a Hungarian restaurant. As was the custom, Dick and I shared our table with two visitors to Berlin, two Swedish sailors with whom we enjoyed talking and sharing a meal even if we did not fully understand everything they said. Then too, they probably didn't get everything that we said either. We had two other favorite restaurants there in uh, Berlin while we were there. Uh, one was a uh, Swiss fondue place uh, near uh, the uh, uh, Clay LA and uh, the uh, uh, Berlin Command headquarters. Uh, where the State Department and other U.S. civilian representatives were also stationed. Uh, the other was uh, Le Pavillon de Loc, uh, the French officers club uh, up uh, on the Tegelse. Uh, the fact of the matter was that uh, American enlisted men like us were paid probably even more than the junior French officers. So we could easily afford to have a meal at the discount prices that uh, were charged there at Le Pavillon, uh, well, let's say once every two months or so. 
And as we arrived in civilian clothes and they didn't bother to check our IDs, uh, there was no question of uh, being told that this is for officers only. Uh, that said, uh, 1962 started with a pyre party at the uh, Myers, uh, shown here. Uh, that's uh, her nibs uh, with a large magnum of champagne. Uh, these are uh, uh, colleagues of mine at the ASA. That's Jim and Ann Wilkinson right there. That's Barb Meyer. Uh, uh, the Meyer's uh, two sons, uh, Randy and Steve, uh, their daughter, Johanna, and uh, yours truly. Um, uh, after that party, we settled into a quiet routine with work, bridge, etc. While many tried and some succeeded in crossing from east to west Berlin and then proceeding on to West Germany. We also went for long walks in Grunwald with Barb and Fred, stopping at times for some uh, mulled wine at the Jägerhutte, uh, a very fine uh, hunting lodge out there in the woods. Uh, Barbara, Annalisa Wegner's middle daughter, celebrated her 21st birthday on January the 27th, also the birthday of Mary Ann's mother. It was a very happy event with a visit by older sister Ingrid shown here. Uh, uh, she was living at that time in Munich with her boyfriend Herbert shown here about 20 years older than she. And here's Frau Wegner taking a look at uh, daughter and prospective son-in-law uh, with a, uh, I'm not sure how to describe that expression on her face. <laughs> um, another guest at the house, at the party, was the son of, uh, that's, uh, all right, here's uh, Barbara's boyfriend, Barbara. This chap is uh, the son of Balder von Schirach, uh, the uh, former head of the Hitler Youth, who at that time was one of three men imprisoned in Spandau prison there in West Berlin. And that's the, uh, uh, that's, uh, the young von Schirach's mother right there. Uh, as I say, uh, the other two Nazis imprisoned in Spandau were Rudolf Hess, who died there in 1987, and Elvis Schwer who like uh, von Schirach was serving a 15 year sentence that would soon expire since he's been in there since about uh, right after the Nuremberg trials. Uh, but the presence of uh, Herbert's uh, was active in the, uh, uh, had also been in the SS. And um, he's, he's a very curious story because um, he had a twin brother and when his parents uh, separated and then divorced, one parent came to the United States with uh, uh, Herbert's brother. Herbert stayed there in Germany uh, in, in Stettin with uh, the other parent. And uh, while uh, Herbert wound up uh, serving with the SS in World War II, his American brother fought on the American side in the European theater. So uh, uh, very, uh, uh, Interesting case, uh, but the presence of uh, and Herbert's the ties that Herbert had with the SS and being from Stettin, and uh, the family's acquaintance at least with the von Schirachs, uh, prompted a question in my mind: uh, uh, Was the uh, missing Herr Wegner, about whom Frau Wegner seldom spoke, the SS Lieutenant Colonel Erwin Wegner, who had died at Saragamunis, France in February 1945. Now, the question really only occurred to me recently when I was trying to remember Herbert's last name. I couldn't, so I started uh, looking into what I could find about uh, Frau Wegner. That led me to Stettin. That led me to uh, the fact that uh, there was a uh, this SS Lieutenant Colonel who was also uh, an Olympic athlete uh, uh, competing in the 1932 and 1936 Olympic games, uh, uh, who uh, this Erwin Wegner, and the age was right. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, I even I could see, I found a picture of him and I could see somewhat of a resemblance that Barbara had uh, with uh, 
the chap that I presume to have been her father. Um, it's uh, just go, you know, it just goes to show you how being uh, asked to do this leads me, led me to uh, uh, go off wandering down uh, a investigatory path that uh, led me to reach some conclusions that may or may not be perfectly valid. Anyhow, uh, that's enough for me. Marianne's about to talk now. Well, now it's time for more of 1962 and exploring outside Berlin. Over the next five months, Dick and I took three trips out of Berlin, south through West Germany, into Switzerland, Alpine Italy, and Austria, north through West Germany to Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. We really enjoyed sitting on the wharf in Oslo, enjoying the sights while we ate tiny raw shrimp. They were delicious. We also went west through West Germany to France, where Dick and I unexpectedly met Roger Weaver right outside of Notre Dame Cathedral. The three of us spent a few days running around Paris, which I had visited for six weeks in 1958, and we had a wonderful time having just enjoying life. Getting out of Berlin for a while was good for all of us. Then Dick and I went back east to Bavaria, where we managed to get together with three of my great uncles. Three brothers had come to the United States, as did my grandmother. She was the oldest of seven, she being the only girl, while the other three remained in Germany. Dick and I enjoyed our brief visit with the latter three a lot, although none of them spoke any English. I spoke very little German. I'm not good at other languages. I have other things I'm good at. And even Dick, who spoke it fairly well, could not understand their Bavarian accents. Fortunately, a nephew was there, spoke English quite well, and was a big help. One uncle lived on the farm where my grandmother grew up. It was very special to me. And there's a story about my grandmother that, that I will tell because we seem to be quite short here. One of my really enjoyment times with my grandmother, and we didn't get to see my grandmother very often or my grandfather. We saw them for a few days every summer or every fall, but only for a few days, that was it. And she would sit and make pastries for us while we were there. She still used a fire stove, which I thought was very interesting coming from northern New Jersey and a place called Summit. And they were called Kiglas and they were a favorite. And the way she made the dough into a shape was over her knee. So she just was bending over her knee and making it all come together. Also, she still had the work stove that I just mentioned. And as I said, the, the pastries were called Kigless. Oh, and here I am again, preparing to depart Berlin in June to August, 1962. In late June, 1962, we had our belongings all packed and ready to come home because we had decided to live with Barb and Fred Meyer for the remaining time so that they could go on the honeymoon they had never had. We took care of sons Randy and Steve and daughter Johanna. Their other daughter Sue had departed West Berlin for college in the United States nine months earlier. I stayed with the Meyers until August 4th when Dick and I took the duty train to Frankfurt when, where I flew back to New York the next day. I then took a bus to Newark where my folks met me and drove me home to Summit, New Jersey, where I had grown up. A hot day in Berlin was about 70 degrees. In Northern New Jersey, 70 was delightful. Eight months later, I gave birth to our son, Rhett. Ah, that Berliner luft. What an incredible experience Berlin was, and we were very fortunate to have it. I still think and talk about Berlin all these years later. There are so many, very many subjects to ponder. The best part is realizing that despite our problems sometimes, we are so very fortunate to be Americans. I stayed with the Myers for another week or so before taking the duty train to Bremerhaven, 
where I boarded a troop ship for a slow cruise to the United States, playing bridge on the deck almost all the way home. After arriving at Fort Hamilton on August 27th, I was quickly discharged, picked up our VW at the storage garage, bought a new battery to replace the one that apparently had been stolen, and drove to Summit as fast as I could, anxious for another reunion with Mary Ann. We feel that our time in Berlin and the experiences we shared there had a huge part in making us who we are today, both individually and as a couple. And we're gonna cherish them forever. Now, there are two incidents I'd like to talk about that did occur uh, that wasn't all peaches and cream. Um, two other incidents that came, uh, happened on Berkbergstrasse where we were sharing that apartment with Frau Wegner and her daughters. But first, one morning when I uh, left the apartment to run across the street to the bakery where I'd grab a order of brochen and run back to douse them with marmalade for breakfast, I uh, discovered that uh, someone had broken into our VW overnight. The car had been parked on the uh, sidewalk. It was, was the custom in Berlin, but apparently uh, two of the uh, teddy boys that frequented the bar next door to the uh, bakery had taken umbrage with its presence. Uh, uh, they broke in, did a real job on the uh, um, steering gear and uh, uh, as I recall, they also left a uh, note about uh, Amerikanische Schweinhund, but, um, you know, American, well, anyhow. Um, I think- Let me, go ahead, finish, yeah, yeah, finish uh, that and let me well, say something. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to bring up the flowers. Yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's next. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. that, that was one episode. Uh, you know, uh, that was the only time it happened. I have a hunch that Barbara, Wagner went across the street and uh, uh, told them the, 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 the uh, facts that uh, I wasn't sleeping with one of uh, Frau Wagner's daughters or some other Freudlein in the apartment. Uh, 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 the lady of my life was uh, an American girl who had joined me there in Berlin. And uh, after that, there were no further incidents with the Teddy Boys. The second incident came after uh, Chris Schwartz gave birth to twins at the U.S. Uh, Army Hospital in Berlin in early July. Um, we wanted to take her a bouquet, so we walked down the street from the uh, apartment to uh, the florist shop nearby, went in, and then for the life of me, I could not remember the German word for flowers. It's blooming. So I was a blooming idiot that day. But anyhow, the point is, uh, the uh, the proprietor finally uh, uh, turned to, uh, you know, why don't you ask your German girlfriend to speak, uh, tell me what you want if, if you can't think of the words. And um, I uh, said, she, in my best uh, uh, German, uh, I said that uh, she's, uh, she's not a German, she's an American. And then I pointed down at her feet and said, uh, in, in fact, look at the shoes she's wearing. She's wearing sneakers, not the high heels that any German girl her age would wear at all times, uh, even when walking uh, on the paths in the Grunewald or running around on the beach uh, out at the Wannsee. Uh, at that point, things got better. Uh, now a few other postscripts. Uh, Mary and I returned to Berlin in May 1969, part of a three-week CIA-sponsored tour of European diplomatic posts to exchange ideas with local U.S. and other experts on Soviet politics. One highlight was our brief visit with Frau Wegner, and as I recall, her daughter Barbara was also there, giving us a chance to catch up on matters that you never seem to mention in the annual postcard. Another major pleasure was spending two nights at Harnack House, Berlin Command's Officers Club, from which my ASA colleagues had been banned after they proceeded to win its duplicate bridge tournaments week after week. And believe me, sleeping on officer's sheets really felt great. Uh, Marianne and I continued to think back to our days in Berlin from time to time, but other matters, particularly those related to the Vietnam conflict, soon pushed the Berlin question off the front pages. We were very surprised and overjoyed to discover on 9 November 1989 
that East Berlin protesters had eventually climbed up on the wall and begun to tear it down earlier that day. We immediately called Hal and Chris to share the news and then got together with Roger Weaver, by then a CIA colleague, to celebrate an event that we never thought we'd, we'd see. It was truly an event worthy of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And here they are, celebrating early the next morning on the 10th. We returned to a reunified Berlin with Hal and Chris in March 2002. Uh, at this time, I was able to join them in visiting uh, parts of the former East Berlin. That's Hal, Chris, yours truly, Marianne, and here are Helga and uh, Helmut Degner, who were our hosts on that occasion, and Helmut had been helping Hal uh, get the material together for a book that uh, would, uh, which he would uh, write his memoirs. Uh, the title is Outpost Berlin, and it gives you a, a grunt's view of uh, the events of 1961 through 1964. Um, um, yeah. We uh, made it a point to uh, visit two memorials, one shown here to the uh, fallen victims of the Berlin Wall, and the other you can read maybe, but uh, I'll just tell you that it's uh, a tribute to the Berliners East and West and the uh, military forces of the uh, US, Britain and France stationed in Berlin from 1945 to 1994, uh, the people who stood tall during the uh, years when the city was divided between East and West. Another moving site for this longtime Russia hand slash cold warrior was the Soviet War Memorial and Military Cemetery at Trep Tower Park in what had formerly been East Berlin. It's massive and it, uh, uh, it again, uh, had a huge impression on me. Uh, I won't go into more detail than that, but uh, if you ever see it, I think it will make a huge impression on you too. Um, at the same time, I could not but feel while there in Berlin that time that I liked the people who had earlier been East Berliners much better than many of those who never had the quote, pleasure, unquote, of living under that communist regime. On Sunday the 9th, as we practiced our Berlin story, I started to cry tears of many memories, both good, so, so both good as such as rejoicing Dick in Berlin on June 20, rejoining Dick in him. <laughs> anyway, rejoining Dick in Berlin on June 28, 1961 and those that were beyond sad. Sometime, someone suggested recently that it was too much for a 20 year old girl to absorb. On the contrary, it was a very important part of my being such a young adult woman. I still to this day talk about Berlin. And as you can see, I have a lot of passion in my eyes right now. And I think you've noticed I've choked up on more than one occasion while offering this presentation. And I've shed more than a few tears at some points when preparing it. And now both of us, for both of us, Berlin, Berlin was, was a, a very, very special and hugely important part of our lives. lives. Amen. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I think, I think this is... <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're a pushover. <laughs> I had... Uh, and, and anybody, if you put questions in the chat, but I had a couple that came to me privately. Uh, actually, uh, let, so let me start with one. It's as you were speaking about uh, people getting guns, people getting, uh, you know, it, it, 
suddenly being supplied with arms, it sounded very much like the US was not ready for what happened. Is that uh, a fair assessment or, or do you think that, that we, we were expecting something like what happened? Judy, the course on Berlin, the, the history of Berlin, that I, uh, the course that I taught at the senior college 11 years ago, the subtitle was uh, a history of Berlin and intelligence failure three times. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, we missed the boat looking the wrong direction when Stalin imposed his blockade back in 1948. We were uh, worried about a Soviet military encroachment into West Berlin, the Soviet takeover of West Berlin. So we were looking again in the wrong direction and uh, missed the signs of uh, uh, what uh, the Soviet side was about to embark on. That's one interpretation. The other is that if you take a look at uh, some of the comments that, uh, uh, oh, who was the chap who was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at that time from uh, Arkansas, as I recall, can't remember his name, but anyhow, uh, there were a couple of U.S. officials that almost seemed to be uh, suggesting in their comment. Yeah, Fulbright, that's right, uh, uh, Bill Fulbright, uh, uh, that um, uh, the uh, uh, we could live with a wall uh, uh, and almost encouraging them. Uh, uh, my cousin Hope Harrison, uh, who arrived in Berlin the morning after the wall collapsed, has two books on Berlin. One is uh, driving the Soviets up the wall, and her account is that it was the East Germans that were, uh, the, the East German tail was wagging the dog on that. Uh, the, but the, the, the point is, yeah, we, we were surprised. We knew they were going to have to do something, but we were worried about something that would encroach uh, 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 on our occupation rights in West Berlin. And we, uh, uh, again, we were surprised in 1989 when the, when the bloody wall came down. I mean, that was, a, uh, there were people in, a lot of people in DC that were uh, very surprised. Um, so um, uh, yeah, we were, we, were, uh, we were looking the wrong, in the wrong direction. We weren't being imaginative enough uh, uh, you know, I can, uh, the, uh, the uh, tragedy of 9-11 is another prime example of that sort of thing. But yeah, yes, indeed. We, we were surprised when uh, they embarked on the idea of putting up barbed wire and then building a concrete wall down the center of the, of the town. Short answer. Not very short. <laughs> when you said we were looking in the wrong direction, what was there, what was that, the purpose of that wall? It was, there's, uh, uh, the, the shorthand is uh, the East Germans, as I said, they, they were losing their best and their brightest. They were losing, uh, I think it was over a thousand people a day there uh, in August, uh, probably a lot more than that. I don't have the exact figure, but the point is it was a huge drain on the East German economy. It was also a blot on their uh, copybook in terms of uh, uh, why would so many people want to leave East Germany if it was the uh, the, the German workers' paradise? Uh, so uh, these uh, these Germans <laughs> smartly uh, at one point turned to Khrushchev and said, "You're going to have to send some uh, uh, unskilled labor to help us out because of all the people we're leaving uh, that are leaving uh, East Germany." And Hitler's, uh, not Hitler, but uh, Khrushchev's reply was that he wasn't about to send Soviet citizens to clean East German toilets. Um, Nikita always was a, a very couth guy, but uh, the Soviets didn't want to bail out the East Germans any more than they needed to. So they uh, uh, agreed to uh, this uh, halfway measure that would uh, uh, stem the flow of refugees out of East Germany because you had people from all over East Germany flocking into East Berlin and then uh, going across the open uh, bear, uh, crossing points there at that time. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, we were putting them on uh, planes and uh, flying them out to West Germany. Uh, East Germany couldn't survive without something being done to stem the, the flow of refugees. And this was the, uh, 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 from the, uh, the Soviet East German side, this was the least bad uh, 
Well, from the Soviet side, this was the least bad solution. I'm not sure that it was the least bad solution for the Germans, but uh, that's another story. Anyhow. I have two questions that came, actually the same question came twice to me, not publicly in the chat, um, that moves away from uh, the period of the wall, but you're gonna get it anyhow. Uh, <laughs> since you since you have uh, worked, uh, you worked so long in the field of, of Russian and Russian foreign policy and diplomacy. Um, would you share with us what you think Mr. Putin is up to now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't warn you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a bunch. Uh, look, uh, uh, Putin was able to undo the uh, uh, the uh, clobbering that uh, uh, his country uh, took when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and then, for various reasons. Uh, the uh, uh, the Russian leaders, both uh, uh, during the Yeltsin period and then uh, uh, afterwards uh, uh, during the, uh, Putin's uh, 20 plus years at the helm, um, they've seen us expand uh, uh, our friendship circles. Uh, NATO has expanded east, absorbing not only former members of the Warsaw Pact, like, uh, oh, uh, let's say Hungary and Poland and uh, Bulgaria, but uh, former uh, uh, republics of the uh, Soviet Union itself, uh, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, Estonia, uh, and uh, 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 this is a very sore point for the, for the Russians. Indeed, uh, the other day, uh, the uh, Russian foreign minister made a comment uh, that uh, kind of says it all. Uh, well, I haven't got it right yet. But it, it, in, in essence, it referred to uh, these new states that had, be, that had uh, uh, reached a stage of uh, non-ownership. In other words, they were no longer owned by anybody. They had previously been obviously owned by the Soviet Union, and thus Russia should be the proper owner today. But they are, uh, some of them have, uh, many of them have already uh, joined both uh, NATO and the European community. And uh, the, uh, the last straw, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, the games, uh, the relations we established both with the Georgia and Ukraine were, they were put on the list of prospective members of NATO and the European community uh, years ago, but without any definite date being set. And the thought, especially, uh, you know, uh, in uh, 2008, uh, Russia went to war against Georgia because it uh, took umbrage with uh, the uh, uh, behavior of the uh, Georgians towards their uh, Russian minority and for various other reasons and uh, actually put us on notice with regard to uh, what was going on in Ukraine. And then in, 19, uh, in, uh, in 2004, they took umbrage with the uh, overthrow of a pro-Russian uh, government there. And then again, the same thing in 2014 when uh, the uh, 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 pro-Russian government was overthrown and uh, you could hear uh, um, uh, Assistant Secretary of State, uh, oh, um, okay, I, I, anyhow, uh, on the square in Kiev talking about, on the phone about uh, who we should support and so on. Um, uh, uh, it, it's, that's a step too far as far as the Russians are concerned. And uh, Putin is doing everything he can to uh, restore Russia to what he regards as its proper status in the world. Russia used to be a, uh, uh, a world power, or the Soviet Union was a world power. It was not a global power, but it was a, uh, a world power. 
Uh, and now, uh, after the uh, uh, breakup of the Soviet Union at the uh, uh, end of December in 1991, uh, it's, uh, for many years, it was a second-rate country, although it did have nuclear weapons. And he's tried to restore it to what he regards as its proper place in the world. And uh, he sees us as the uh, uh, major obstacle to that course. Uh, to that end, he's even gotten buddy buddy with the Chinese, uh, uh, with whom uh, the uh, the Russians cannot be completely comfortable because the Chinese have a long memory and they remember a mistreatment at the hands of the Russians going back to the Tsarist period of the fifteenth, uh, sixteenth, uh, and seventeenth centuries. For Lord's sakes, um, he uh, the other part of it is he's a thug, uh, and uh, but he's a clever thug. And like a, a, a clever uh, 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 mafia leader uh, operating in uh, Brooklyn uh, or uh, uh, other parts of the U.S. Uh, or down in Sicily or wherever the, you or or a member of the Russian mafia, these guys are clever and they don't hesitate to use power and uh, and they uh, they they're very good at playing dirty. And that's what he's been doing. I mean, the uh, to my mind, uh, what I can't understand about the negotiations going on right now is uh, why are we simply trying to respond to the Russian-created uh, crisis along the uh, Russian border with Ukraine, as opposed to presenting a bill for uh, reparations for the downing of that Malaysian airliner back in the summer of uh, 2014, the ones that Russian uh, air defense crews shot down over eastern Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, 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 over time, we, we lose track of what the heck we ought to be toting up on our side of the uh, scorecard in, in terms of presenting a bill of particulars to the other side. And we play defense in the negotiations that are going on. And he knows that uh, right now is a good time for him to uh, try to get the best deal he can from the United States. And in the process, he can uh, drive wedges between the U.S. and the Europeans, which is a prime objective of his. Well, that leads to a question that's sitting here now in the chat that, that you started, I think. Uh, what lessons have we learned that we should be applying in 2022? And I think you just gave us one. <laughs> uh, I would say precious damn few. Uh, to be perfectly candid, we uh, uh, and the reason why I say that is we uh, uh, over my 30 years at CIA and in the uh, 25 plus since then, uh, if you give me uh, uh, several hours, I can uh, recite time and again where we have momentarily learned a lesson only to forget about it by the time uh, the next guys are in charge. Um, and this is true of, of uh, at least this was true during my years on the agency. We should have learned a lesson in uh, 1968 uh, when the Soviet side sent forces into Czechoslovakia to intervene there with what was going on. We didn't, so we were surprised again when the Soviets opted to do so uh, by sending uh, forces into Afghanistan in December of 1979 to intervene there. And uh, they're willing to use forces again um, if they feel, uh, especially if they feel that what is going on in that locale that they believe belongs properly in their sphere of influence also has the potential for creating problems within their own territory, within Russia itself. If the Ukrainians can go and succeed in building a democratic regime, a government, administration in Kiev and throughout uh, Ukraine, my God, that has terrible implications for Putin's rule in Russia, because it means that uh, 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 if the Ukrainians can do it, why can't we Russians do it? And that's the last thing. Well, I'm I back when we yeah. were in Ukraine, I don't even remember what year. It was. 2007. Okay, 2007, with Hal and Chris. And it was very clear that the kids who were high school age or young college age 
they were so excited about seeing four Americans who were there and talking to them about how they wanted freedom. And a lot of them were down on the, the square and at the edge of town. And they were talking about it. They were singing and dancing and having a wonderful time. And that's already a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if some of you will remember, there was one course where I showed you the clip about Putin on the Ritz, where uh, Russian uh, uh, youth had staged a, uh, a mob, uh, you know, what is it, a, uh, uh, one of those flash mobs. Uh, up on the uh, bluffs overlooking the uh, uh, the Olympic Stadium there uh, in uh, in Moscow, so uh, the, these things do not get quarantined, and uh, Putin's aware of it, uh, especially be, given the fact that he was a young, uh, well, thirty seven year old uh, KGB officer stationed in uh, uh, Dresden when the uh, uh, Berlin Wall collapsed. And uh, he, he was scarred by the fact that when uh, uh, he uh, called Moscow for instructions on what to do, they were afraid that they were about to be murdered by an, uh, uh, East uh, German uh, revolutionaries there in, uh, in Dresden. And he didn't get any response from uh, Moscow. And I think at that point, he vowed that uh, if I have, I'm ever in a position to prevent it, I'm not going to allow this to happen. Uh, on my watch, and certainly not in Russia itself, and that's that's a major concern on his part, uh, uh, even today. I mean, this is why he's taken all the steps he has to uh, um, <clears throat> imprison or uh, uh, exile uh, any uh, uh, would-be rivals for political power. Uh, he's closed down uh, the human rights organizations one after another, and uh, he, he's. Uh, 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 more than hap more than willing, as he just did, send forces into Kazakhstan the other day to uh, uh, on a temporary mission to restore order, the, restore what he terms to be proper order, and that's what he uh, that's his ultimate mission in U in Ukraine to restore proper order. In other words, we uh, put power back in the hands of people who are uh, pro Russia in their orientation. To go back, when we have a, we do have a question in the chat that uh, speaks to the to to the the asks the question, um, or I'll put it differently. I'll turn it around. That uh, based on on the book learning from the from the Germans and a review of a book by a German author that the Germans, uh, if I'm if we're going back, uh, were more interested in seeing themselves as victims than as perpetrators, and that the East Germans were. Um, the next generation of East Germans was, were, were more, more quickly took responsibility for the Holocaust than did the West Germans. Did you find that to be true and would you comment? Uh, I think that is true, but I think it was for political reasons. Um, the uh, they uh, back in that day, uh, the uh, Soviet authorities and their uh, their the Soviet authorities found it very convenient to uh, make the case that uh, all the uh, uh, former Nazis were in the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, rather than to be found in East Germany. Uh, uh, that's not true at all, uh, and. Um, uh, I, but I think there were po political motives involved in uh, painting uh, West Germany as the haven for uh, uh, all the former SS and uh, other uh, 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 people responsible for the Holocaust and uh, for uh, uh, everything that happened uh, during the Hitler years. Uh, the, uh, I think the truth is that you had uh, uh, a lot of uh, former Nazis who were uh, quick to uh, collaborate with uh, whichever regime uh, uh, was the uh, one that, on whose territory they were, uh, they found themselves. Um, 
I think uh, we found that at least uh, some of the, uh, uh, for instance, the head of the East German Stasi at one point uh, was uh, a chap who uh, uh, had a somewhat checkered earlier career. Uh, and you had, um, uh, um, to be candid, also, we found it expedient to uh, make a common cause with a lot of the former people that had been very uh, uh, instrumental in uh, the German effort against the Soviet Union. I mean, CIA hired the entire Galen organization headed up by uh, 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 General uh, Galen, who I think was an SS general. I'm not sure about, I'd have to go back and check on that because I, I, I really don't remember. But anyway, the, the point is we were very anxious to get our hands on all the files that he had, uh, not only on the uh, Soviet order of battle, but also on who was whom in terms of the officials of one Soviet province after another, as well as those that were higher up in uh, office in, uh, in Moscow or St. Petersburg. But uh, uh, and we, back in the uh, immediate period after World War II, uh, we were uh, very quick uh, because we didn't have any sort of a book on Soviet affairs then. Uh, our intelligence effort against uh, the Soviet Union had been shortstopped to a large extent back in the mid 30s uh, uh, because it would get in the way of a uh, effort to focus U.S. efforts on the uh, threat posed by uh, Nazi Germany on the one hand and uh, Imperial Japan on the other. So uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the people that worked on Soviet matters uh, at the State Department or elsewhere uh, were uh, uh, either uh, sh shipped off to other posts or uh, uh, let go. Uh, it was akin to the purge of China experts uh, right after World War II, when uh, in the uh, immediate aftermath, the, the big issue was who lost China. So we got rid of all of the China experts who had failed to uh, predict the uh, uh, takeover by Mao Zedong in 1949. We're very good at that. We, we, we're very good at learning that lesson. Uh, as a, uh, and uh, frequently they, they do come back to bite you uh, 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 where it's uh, most uncomfortable. Um, I don't know as if I've really answered the question, but uh, there were, uh, I, I mean, there were a hell of a lot of former SS guys running around uh, West Germany uh, uh, at the time that Marianne and I were uh, in, uh, in Berlin. And the other side of that coin is while well, we executed some of the high ranking Nazi officials uh, uh, after the Nuremberg trials, uh, Rudolf Hess and uh, uh, Albert Speer and uh, uh, Baldar von Schirach all uh, served out, uh, well, Hess died there, but uh, the other two served out a 15 year term and then were released. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm wandering, I know, but uh, yeah, she may have more questions. Go, go ahead, to go ask. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead, fire away. Hi, <laughs> this one. What didn't we ask you that we should have? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, hmm. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with my aunt, uh, with some of my comments, you might uh, get the impression that I'm uh, uh, anti lifer or anti uh, officer. Actually, there were several really crackerjack officers in our unit in Berlin. Uh, two of them were the guys who ran the uh, shop that uh, took a look at uh, what we uh, uh, were able to uh, gather and uh, make initial judgments on it, along with Bill Stearns and some of the others who were really uh, a, a grade or two above me as far as uh, the, their ability in the Russian language. They were two good guys. Uh, one of my favorite guys was a, uh, uh, a career military man, uh, uh, Major uh, Charlie Hagopian. Uh, he had started out as a PFC in the early days of, or as a buck private during the early days of World War uh, Two, 
rose all the way to the rank of uh, sergeant major, got himself not only a college degree, but a law degree, and then uh, was our executive officer there in Berlin uh, in the early days of my presence there in uh, 61. Uh, he was the real deal. Uh, he, uh, had, uh, he, he got tasked with giving us the troop information briefings, which uh, we all uh, kind of quietly uh, laughed at. Uh, that, that was the word according to Berlin Command. But uh, he was, as I say, he was the real deal, as I discovered uh, one day out on the rifle range. And he couldn't wait to get away from us. And as soon as he could, he got himself a transfer to the Judge Advocate General's uh, office there at Berlin Command, where, as I've heard, he made sure that every guy that came before him uh, with some sort of a uh, uh, situation got a fair deal. Uh, he, uh, he remembered where he came from and uh, was a, uh, a, a real guy. Uh, another one was the uh, lieutenant who uh, ran the technical shop of our shop. He was a he was a crackerjack too, uh, you know, uh, no nonsense. Just did the job and and, and didn't uh, he, he didn't pull rank on any of the emen, emen, uh, ems under him. Uh, indeed, he respected the fact that uh, in some cases they knew more about the uh, the equipment and how to operate it than uh, than he did, and uh, he was he was the real deal. Um, Another question you, you could be interested in, perhaps. Um, um, where, oh, heck. Where's my list? <laughs> There's a list here, but I think this is... Yeah, well, Donna, list. Judy, I, I sent you a list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making you think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, the question, yeah, uh, that the... Um, you're you're not seeing this as acquaintances and and you know how you dealt with them and and um what were some of your conclusions i'm sorry say that again Acquaint you're the oh, SS. acquaintances oh um um uh, well, the, uh, the, the, the colleagues in the ASA, uh, they were great guys. Uh, I never joined the uh, uh, alumni association that they formed, that they'd formed before I even got there. But uh, uh, the, the guys were, uh, were really good. Uh, and uh, one, uh, uh, the one thing I'll say about the Russian linguist was that uh, in a way, they made a mistake by sending uh, to the uh, language school guys that had completed uh, two, three, or four years of college. If they had only got two years, uh, there was one guy who uh, dropped out of Harvard after two years, uh, became a Russian linguist, and later presumably went back to school because the next thing I knew, he was the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Commerce under uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. So he obviously uh, went. And the, the point I'm making is, uh, the retention rate for us linguists was probably down about 0.5%. Uh, we, uh, we, we were not uh, uh, re-enlistment uh, material. Uh, we all wanted to get on with our lives. Uh, we took the job seriously, uh, although uh, there were nights where uh, uh, when you were on the mid shift and things were slow, uh, we'd uh, grab a pile of burn bags, spread them around on the floor, and uh, take a nap while uh, two or three guys on shift uh, would uh, mind the store, and we take turns. Uh, you nap for three hours, uh, two hours, I'll nap for two hours, and uh, then uh, we'll let Jack do it and so on to get through those long uh, uh, overnight shifts. But um, uh, the, uh, the, the German acquaintances, you, you really didn't have that many. The, uh, 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 partly because uh, with the ASA guys, it was, uh, I think, largely because we all had top secret clearances and we'd been warned that every third person in uh, West Berlin was an, East, uh, an agent of either the East Germans or the Soviets. You're looking for Al Wagner? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Enough for Al Wagner, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Miss Algren. Miss Algren, yeah. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the uh, German couple that was uh, uh, down in the basement of Berlin Command uh, 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 taking pictures for all the ID cards that were issued to both the GIs and uh, their wives. Uh, if the, if the, if the, That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, that couple. 
also were uh, agents for the East German Stasi. They were so, arrested at the same time yeah, as Alderman. Yeah. And the, the point is, you were you were warned uh, that the only uh, you know for the guys that were bachelors, uh, uh, many of them either. Uh, I mean, one of uh, one of our colleagues, Tom Schaefer, was a uh, a, a bicycle nut. And he would take his bicycle and uh, go on leave. Uh, they take it with him on the duty train because that was the only way we could get from Berlin to West Germany was to go on the train. We weren't allowed. Uh, uh, Marianne could, but I couldn't drive through uh, East Germany back to uh, the West, uh, nor could I fly on a commercial flight. Um, the only way I could go in and out of Berlin was on the duty train. Tom would take his bicycle on the train, uh, get off at Helmstedt at the border, and then pedal all the way through Germany or whatever. That's the way he killed uh, time while he was there. Uh, a lot of the other guys, it was play bridge or uh, some other card game, uh, drink. Uh, we uh, uh, A lot of the guys, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, came home as uh, alcoholics because there was nothing else to do. And uh, then uh, you would, uh, uh, some of them became uh, customers of, uh, uh, Big Chris, <laughs> or one of the other ladies of ill repute. And the reason why I bring up Big Chris is that one of our colleagues, a really great guy, he got kind of drunk one night, uh, 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 spent some time with Big Chris, and then came back home the next morning, discovered his uh, 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 dog tags were missing. So uh, like uh, any of us, uh, if you're in trouble, your first stop of call uh, is with uh, uh, Mitch. Uh, because he was in the uh, criminal investigation uh, group. And uh, so uh, Don uh, took Mitch, I mean, Mitch took uh, uh, Charlie back to uh, Big Chris's apartment and knocked on the door. And Chris, Charlie needs his dog tags, at which point Chris came on out with a bureau drawer full of dog tags to say, which ones are his? <laughs> That's but that, that that was that was the degree of interaction. Uh, we of course living with Frau Wegner and two of her three daughters uh, had a bit more regular contact with regular folk than uh, was the uh, the custom. I mean, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I could also add that Marianne and I stopped off and uh, spent a night with uh, uh, Herbert and Ingrid at their place uh, down uh, uh, in uh, Munich on our way down to the uh, uh, Alpine Italy and uh, uh, Austria and uh, uh, about uh, this time uh, back in 1962. Uh, so, so just about 60 years ago, yeah. Um, okay, guys, <laughs> we've, we've, we're, we're gonna get turned off if we don't stop. So <laughs> this is, we'd love to hear the rest of them, Dick, but I, the uh, the Zoom people are gonna are gonna get us, and I just thank you, Dick. Thank you, Marianne. From you're all welcome, us. Judy. <laughs> you are very welcome. And and thank you, as always, to Brenda in the Belfast Library. Yes, Brenda, thank you. Who, yes, Brenda, who thank you. Been with us, and thank, and and thank you. <laughs> and thank you to all of you who joined us yes. and I hope we see you at Camden Conference. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>